Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're so happy to have you here today. I hope everybody's staying warm. Um, this is our January edition of our Cyber Mentoring, and today we're welcoming Ms. Melissa Eddy. She's a program manager at DHR Health Institute for Research and Development, and today we're going to talk about research. Um, I'm very happy to have you with us. We are recording this and it will be available uh, at a later time. Uh, when Miss Eddie's done speaking, we'll open the floor for questions. So as she's talking, think about things that you'd like to ask and, and discuss further. So welcome, Miss Eddie. We're very happy to have you here with us. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, I hope I'm looking at the right camera. You're looking good. <laughs> if I'm not looking at the camera, it's because I'm looking at my notes here or somewhere else on the screen. So just remind me if, I, if I'm not looking in the right place. But That's what I'm gonna fine. attempt to do right now is, um, is share my PowerPoint. Um, let's see. I'm not sure that this is gonna work here. Window, there we go. All righty. Um, all right, boys and girls. Well, maybe I'll just talk to you for a little bit before I actually share that. So my name is Melissa Eddy. I am from McAllen, Texas. I am a recently retired AP biology teacher from McAllen Memorial High School. Um, I had 30 years experience and I just recently retired and, and decided to take a new career pathway. So um, um, I'm very happy to be here with you and I'll give you a little bit of my history. Um, I, I may not look it, but I am Hispanic, so I do represent females in STEM. And I can tell you that that is not always the easiest road. So that's why <laughs> I think it's of us great. Are there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you so many professors did not take me seriously uh, at the beginning of courses. They didn't take me seriously until they saw my test grades, until they read my papers, and then they really knew who I was. So, you know, of course, that was 30 years ago or <laughs> whenever it was that I went to college, but I, I still feel that there, there is, you know, a little of that uh, around. Science is a male dominated field. Um, and um, you know what, girls, we can do it too. Mm -hmm. So let me get that PowerPoint shared. Great. All right. I agree with you. It's very hard being one of the only females in STEM uh, where I am at region one. Uh, it's mostly male dominated and I just feel like I'm proven every day that we can do this. That's right. And, and this is not knocking males by any means. Uh, don't take it wrong, boys. Um, just saying, you know, girls, sometimes we have to fight a, a bigger battle here. So um, somebody give me some feedback. Are you able to see my slideshow? Yes, we are able to see. Uh, what if, do you have any suggestions on how you can I go ahead should and present it from the beginning where it says from the beginning. Yes, I, I did that. I did that. I did. I believe that. Listen, kids, I know how to run zoom. <laughs> I do. But it this is not, not my you. laptop. This is not my laptop. So let me see if I can do that from the beginning. Yes, that's that's what I'm doing. It has to do, I think, with the display settings. Is everybody OK with this? Yeah, I think this is good. You can okay. go through it like this. We can see it. Okay. And for those of you who are fast readers, you can read my next slide. But anyway, um, so I've entitled this little talk, How Research Can Open Doors for You. Because although I was a biology teacher, I did do some biological research. And I can tell you, it really, really opened up career doors for me. And so I'll get to that. Uh, but again, there is my name, Melissa Rios Eddy, and I am the South Texas, uh, I'm sorry, the program director for the South Texas Academy for Education and Training and Research at DHR Health Institute for Research and Development. So, all righty. So there's the whole title thing, right? Uh, I am from McAllen, Texas, as I mentioned, and I'm brand new here at DHR. I've been charged with overseeing the program for students. We have a uh, a junior clinical research internship program that we run in the summers. So I hope many of you will be interested in attending. It's a chance for you to actually, you know, get your hands on some of this stuff that we're doing at the Institute, visit the hospital, see what current research is being done at DHR. 
Um, as I mentioned, I taught for 30 years at McGowan Memorial. I was an AP biology teacher and I actually started the course my very first year teaching and I taught it every year. Um, is anybody in AP bio right now? You can just kind of give me a, um, I guess thumbs I won't up. be able to see. Yeah, give me a thumbs up. I don't think I'll be able to see it, but if you're taking AP bio, let me know, or even, even uh, biology one, different schools do things differently. Um, strangely, I taught AP Bio for 30 years at my own alma mater. So I am a graduate of McGowan Memorial as well. Uh, in addition to working at McGowan Memorial, I also taught at STC as adjunct faculty in the biology department. And then I also served as a consultant for college board. That is uh, for six years, I taught teachers how to teach AP Biology. And I also worked for the National Math uh, and Science Initiative which some of your schools may have the NIMSI grant. I don't know if you do, but I also worked for them um, as a presenter. So um, just kind of a, a diverse uh, career background there. But uh, here's my path. This is the next slide. What is my path to becoming the program manager at DHR? What I can tell you from the start is I probably wouldn't be here if I hadn't pursued a master's degree in biology if I hadn't done research in my field. You know, there's a lot of teachers and they're wonderful teachers, but they teach and that's really the only thing that they do day in and day out, but I wanted more, I wanted more. So I pursued research uh, again at the graduate level and there's a picture of me down here at the bottom. <laughs> like I say, I wasn't doing clinical research in a health setting. My research was biological. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, it was grueling. It was grueling, but you know what? I wanted it. And again, it really, really opened up many doors for me, as I'll explain. So I would say after earning my master's degree in biology, well, let me backtrack. I went to UT UTRGB. I went to UTRGB. It was UTPA back then. I got a degree in biology, as you can see from the slide. I also worked part-time to help my parents. I was very, very lucky to have graduated without any debt. You know, I, I'm so thankful to my parents for sacrificing. Um, I helped, but they, they did most of it for me. So I am very, very, very blessed in that, in that aspect. But um, my parents paid for my undergraduate. I became a teacher. And as soon as my first year of teaching was over, I went to graduate school. I started my first master's degree course in biology. Let me interrupt a moment. We need you to click on the slides as you go along because we're only seeing the very first slide. The first slide. Well, uh, I'm looking at my path. Okay, we're not there yet. Hmm. Well, Ms. now Melissa, are you seeing I that? Suggest, might I suggest that when you're sharing the screen, maybe you select uh -huh. the, other, the other screen. The other screen. Be, yeah, when you share your screen, there should be multiple, multiple um, screens. Um, and I think you need to it, stop sharing and then go back to sharing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, let's try this again. When you so when I open your screen, click. Don't click on your whole thing. Click on only the PowerPoint. Okay. Because we want so, to see all of your presentation. Let's try this one. How's that? Give it a second. Yes, perfect. That's okay. There it is. Yes, I, I realize what I was doing now. Okay. So, thank you. Um, again, yes, thank you so much. Again, I think next time I'll use my own device. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so, so back to this. Um, so I started my first master's degree cl uh, class uh, and I was saying that um, actually when I started college, I started off as a health professions major. I, I thought I wanted to be a nurse. I had a high school teacher who always told me, you can be a doctor, you can do it. But I really doubted myself. Um, and I was interested in health professions, but when I got to college, I wasn't so sure that I wanted to be around people who were ill, you know? So I, I really loved biology and I found that I, that I had a knack for teaching biology and I actually love teaching biology. So I went that route and that's a really great route. If anybody's interested in becoming a teacher, it's a wonderful route. 
you get to spend time with your children that sometimes you're not able to in other careers. Uh, but anyway, finishing uh, my first year of teaching, I started my first graduate class in biology and I continued to take these classes while working full time. And I started to get really serious about it. And when you're getting a master's degree, um, typically, at least in a master of science, you can choose between thesis and non-thesis route. So what a thesis is, is basically, it's, it's basically a book that I wrote, um, detailing all the research that I did and the results that came from it. So as a scientist, I thought, you know, I really need to go the thesis route. It's harder. Mm -hmm. It's harder. I'll tell you that. But I said, how can I be a scientist if I've never done the research? So uh, I went ahead and went thesis route. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, there's a little picture of me at the bottom of the screen. And we're not sat we're not still. still. You're not. <laughs> I don't know why, because. Um, it flashes on and then goes off. I don't know what to tell you because. Um, you can see it. I can see it. And I've never had this before where it flashes on and then goes off. Uh, um, well, I'll try I, to work on it. I'll try to work on it um, and talk at the yeah. same time. Because yeah. <laughs> you're a teacher. You know how to do that. That's right. And OK, so I don't even know where this And thank all you is. students for being so patient. We truly appreciate that. Yes. I, again, I do know how to use Zoom. Here we go. All right, so am I sharing? Am I sharing? Not yet. No, not yet. Okay, so let's share the screen. Let's share screen one. Okay, let's try this. How's that? We can see it. Okay, so let me get it on the current slide. Here, now we can see it. Okay, all righty. Thank you. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> so, so there's a picture of me at the bottom in my actual research environment. Um, it was a, a study on the environmental factors that a plant or plants, there were five species, um, that they experience in their environments and how these things like length of day, temperature, rainfall, all of those kinds of things, how those factors impact how the plants grow. You know, how does it impact their leaf production, their shoot or branch elongation? Um, how does it impact their flower and fruit production? So it was a 13 month study. And I'll tell you, it was grueling because I had to go to three sites every other weekend, three different places, completely all day, Saturday and Sunday, three different sites, every other weekend, rain or shine, hot or cold, sick or well, I can tell you, uh, you know, I had to be there. I had to go collect my data. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. Didn't matter if it was cold. Didn't matter if it was raining. Didn't matter if I was sick. I had to do it. 13 months of that. And I thought that was the hard part. <laughs> the hard part, <laughs> the hard part was, and, and let me throw this in, um, what I would do, I had made some data sheets and every time I'd go collect data, I'd spend the next week or so inputting the data into Excel. Yes, we had Excel way back then. <laughs> um, and so when I finished all of my data collections, what I ended up doing was printing out all of these Excel spreadsheets and I had to tape them into maps that were about I don't know, a meter across and a meter tall, those would be the data for one particular date from the three sites. And I thought the data collection was hard until I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to analyze these data. <laughs> that was the hard part. And I had a really tough, a tough advisor at UTRGV, um, Dr. Judd, stickler for detail. And I can't tell you how many times I would send him drafts and he would send me the draft back, bleeding with red <laughs> ink. I don't know if any, of, if any of you have ever had teachers turn work back into you that way. And, 
and it was tough. And let me throw out at this point that I was pregnant. I had gotten married. Um, I was pregnant with my first child and I was in the process of analyzing the data and writing the thesis. So I was extra tired, extra emotional, <laughs> but I got through it. And when you, when you do a thesis, um, what, you, what you have to do is you have to present it to an audience. Anybody can ask any kind of questions that they want. Your professors are there, they can ask questions. Then afterwards you go into a room and they basically grill you on your research. What did you find? What does it mean? How did you find that out? Um, and so I had my thesis defense and then there's a final oral exam where they can ask you anything about biology. So there I was on a Friday doing my thesis defense and my final oral examination. That was a Friday. <laughs> and my son was born the next Thursday. <laughs> so <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. So that's the research story. And I was doing that, by the way, while working full time as a teacher. OK, so uh, the whole point of that story is to tell you that that experience really opened doors for me. I wasn't just a teacher. I was a teacher with a master's degree and I had done a thesis. I had done research that opened doors for me. Automatically, I began to be able to teach dual enrollment at uh, STC through STC because you have to have a master's degree. So I did that for a number of years. And having taught AP biology for so many years, I thought, you know, I, I want to give back. I want to help those new teachers who are just starting out in AP biology. So I became a consultant and you have to have a master's degree and you have to apply and you have to interview for that position. So um, I did that for several years. Let me just tell you some of the places that I have presented so you can see how this research changed my life. I have been to, I presented in Alaska. Illinois, Washington, D.C., Florida, North Dakota, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., maybe I said that, Florida, um, let's see where else, Abu Dhabi, and Kazakhstan, just to name a few of the places, you know, you, you kind of lose track. So, so this, this thesis opened the door for me to travel around the world and help teach other teachers. So, you know, it was really great. Um, but again, after 30 years, I've decided, you know, it's time. It's time for me to let somebody new move into the AP biology position. I'm ready to try something else because I'm young. You might not think so. I'm 52. But I got a lot of years left in me to work. So I decided, you know, I want to I want to seek something outside of education. I want to try something new. I want a new challenge. And that is when I applied to be the program manager for this student program that we run. Does anybody have any questions so far? I opened up the chat, students and teachers. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, I'll have some questions. I can already see you're answering some of the questions that we typically have. Exactly what you have on the screen right now is what's your typical day like? Yes, I'm glad we're, <laughs> I'm glad we're seeing. Okay, well, don't be afraid to ask any questions. You know. Um, we're here to talk about clinical research and I'm getting to that. But if you're interested in, in a biology degree, if you're interested in being a teacher, if you're interested in doing research out in the field, which was tough, I'll tell you that. Let me tell you, by the way, if you are gonna be a biologist and you wanna do research, plants, plants are excellent subjects because they don't go anywhere. They're always there. People who do research, let's say on javelina or birds, some days the birds don't show up and you can't get data, right? Some days they're hiding, sometimes, you know, they might migrate to another part of the country. So you have to adjust your schedule. So plants, they're always there. They can't leave. <laughs> All right, but let's talk about my new position. So I've recently started here and I'm, I'm charged with uh, overseeing this program that we have in partnership with Region 1 for students, okay? Last fall, there was a research conference on um, clinical clinical research. Maybe some of you attended it. Um, we have one coming up in February, February 23rd to be specific. This one is for adults. It's for teachers, um, counselors, administrators, anyone that your school decides um, is gonna be able to counsel students about 
research in a clinical healthcare type environment. So some of you teachers may be attending. And we'll be talking about all different kinds of pathways, um, not only research, but medical pathways, you know, um, dentistry, things like that. So uh, we, we, we will have a handbook for you teachers and counselors and an admin to share with your students because a lot of times, you know, we, we don't know the pathways. That was kind of my problem as a student. My parents didn't go to college. My dad had taken a, a few classes um, at, I guess it was Pan American back then. Um, he was working full time. He didn't spend a lot of time studying. You know, he, he tried, but I didn't have anybody. I didn't have a single person telling me how to get through college, what classes to take, what time to register for classes. I really didn't have anybody who knew, you know? Um, so again, uh, that's what this handbook is that we're gonna be providing to teachers, the, the pathways, uh, counselors and admin as well. But let's get back to what a day in my life is like. So every day I get this opportunity to work with extremely accomplished physicians. This office has many physicians and they are currently working on research projects. And then in addition to that, we have research coordinators. These are typically um, younger people, I'd say in their 20s. Um, they have bachelor's degrees. Many of them have master's degrees and they are currently doing research here in the Rio Grande Valley on things like COVID-19, on neuroscience, on liver cancer, which by the way, we have one of the highest rates of liver cancer here in the Rio Grande Valley. Did you know that? Uh, also individuals are doing research on diabetes, which of course you probably know that that is a real problem here. There's a health crisis in the Valley and that's what this Institute is, dedicating, is dedicated to researching. So I get to work with these extremely talented individuals every day. Now I'm not actually doing the research. I thought, wow, maybe I should have applied. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I'm more on the business end. I'm running the program, invoicing quotes, setting up events, things like that. But I'm overseeing the curriculum. I'm here with the people doing the research. And that's the kind of stuff that we're going to convey to students. In that summer program, as I mentioned, students will have the opportunity to come here to the Institute, to go to DHR, again, to, to get hands-on experience with the research uh, opportunities here at DHR. So definitely uh, think about it. You may be interested. We are going to take uh, 50, uh, sorry, it's 90, 90, and six from the different region one programs. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a two week, a two week intensive experience all day. You're not getting paid, but you are building that resume. Okay. So think about that. And you may have questions about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, so if you wanted to work here as a researcher, at minimum, I'd say you'd probably want to get a master's degree in biology. A bachelor's degree might open the door, but a master's degree in biology or biochemistry, something like that, is really going to you know, give you that edge to be a research coordinator. Definitely your opportunities will increase if you pursue a PhD, which is a doctorate degree in biology or a health-related field, um, or even an MD medical doctor degree. Because again, our physicians here are doing research. They are doctors, medical doctors, but they also do research on a number of topics. So um, fun facts. I am a lifelong learner. I mean, that's one reason I decided I wanted to take a new career pathway. I want to learn more things. And one of the best things about working here at DHR Health Institute for uh, Research and Development is I get access to the latest on the COVID research that's being done here. Um, it keeps me informed. It, you know, nourishes my biological mind. Um, and what I put in here is a link to one of the most recent papers that some of our scientists published. Now, let's see if this link will actually work. Probably not. Anyway, I'll tell you what this paper is about. I can share it in the chat a little bit later. Okay. But this, this paper is about... Phages. Is there anybody who knows what a phage is? A bacteriophage. Have you studied that yet? And I can't see the chat, so I don't I, know. I'm seeing the chat, but nobody's answered yet. Nobody knows what a phage is. So a phage is a virus. 
a virus that attacks bacteria. Okay, so you all know that we get viruses like COVID and flu and things like that. Bacteria, which you think of, you know, causing infections, and some of them do, bacteria can also get viral infections as well. So maybe you know, or maybe you don't know, but we are now in an environment where many of our bacterial infections have become resistant to the antibiotics, to the medications that we have developed to kill those bacteria. You may have heard of MRSA, Staph, for those of you who are athletes, we're talking about many of these bacteria that cause infections, they're not responding to the medications that we have. And that's scary, you know, because antibiotics were only discovered by accident in the late 1920s. And they were only marketed as medications starting in the 1940s. So it hasn't even been a hundred years that we've been using them and they're quickly becoming obsolete bacteria are mutating and becoming resistant to these drugs. So it's really, really scary. You know, one of the leading causes of death in the 1800s was childbirth. You know, we didn't know about germs. And so as people were delivering babies, they had dirty hands, they had dirty instruments. Females would, would get terrible infections, you know, in their abdominal cavity and that would kill them. So that was before antibiotics. I'm telling you, we're moving towards a time where there may not be antibiotics anymore. So what researchers are currently looking into is how can we use these bacteriophages, these viruses that attack bacteria, how can we use them to combat bacterial infections? And that's what this paper is, is about. It's about our actual researchers here using certain bacteriophages to combat a lung infection, all right? Successfully combating this bacterium that was resistant. So this, this, is, this is the new wave, guys. Very new this and is exciting. the medicine of the future. What's that? It's very new and exciting. It is, it is. Yeah, I don't think, I don't know if I can uh, click on this link while I'm in the display mode. Um, so anyway, I'll share that with you when we finish talking and then you know you can kind of if you want to look at the link you can i'll just i'll just take you to the paper and you can see it but that's what the people here are doing every day they're researching new options new cures new treatments and that's here in the rio grande valley and we definitely want to to encourage you to come to the summer program again and perhaps consider a career in this field okay so what if you're interested in a research career? You know, sometimes you're a quiet person. You don't really like talking a lot. You know, you just, you wanna do your work. You wanna get into your studies. Hey, this is a great field for you. You know, maybe you just have this passion for, you know, medicine, but you don't wanna actually be a physician. This is the field for you, okay? I mean, you can really make a difference. You can make a difference as a teacher, definitely. Right. Uh, I can't tell you how many kids I said, you you need to follow your dreams. Don't be afraid. You can do this. I mean, I was known as a savage, right, for pushing, <laughs> people, push, push, push. I'm not going to take no. You can do this. All right. So, you know, that's the attitude that, that you have as a teacher and you can change lives that way. Mm -hmm. You can change lives as a researcher directly. So think about that. So, again, hopefully you can see the helpful tips. If you are interested in a career in research, one way that you can get started is while in high school, take AP seminar and AP research if you have the capstone program at your school. Many schools in the Valley have started offering this. If you don't know what it is, uh, AP seminar is the first course and you learn the art of written argumentation. The second year, AP Research is where you conduct your very own research project on anything you want. It doesn't even have to be medical or science. It could be in art, it could be in music. You do the research, you write the paper, you have the oral presentation, just like I was talking about in college. If your school doesn't have it, ask your counselors, how can we get AP Capstone here? How can we be an AP Capstone school? Because that will give you the research experience in high school that will give you an edge once you get to college. If you wanna be a biological researcher, what better thing to have on your resume than to say in high school, 
you did research on whatever. Just last year, I had a student. She was working on phage research. She literally was doing that during the pandemic, during distance learning. She was doing phage research, soil phages, which is where they actually typically find them in soil and sewage, by the way, interestingly. Um, another thing that you can do in high school is you can uh, apply to be in our junior, uh, junior clinical research internship in the summer. And it's going to be an annual, an annual thing. So if you're not ready this summer, maybe next summer will be uh, your time. Um, this is for rising juniors. So it would be the summer after your sophomore year. That's who uh, we accept to the program. What kind of skills do you need? I will tell you that you need to be proficient um, in technology. Definitely Word, um, Excel, PowerPoint. And, and I know a lot of schools are using the Google suite, the G suite. Um, that's what we used at my school. But what I'm going to tell you is that on the business end, most businesses don't use the G suite. Okay. They use Microsoft Office. So if you have the opportunity to get um, Office certified or Excel certified through your classes at school, definitely you can do that. That will give you an edge. Definitely. If you can take statistics in high school, whether it's CP or AP, whatever, do it. You got to know the math. That was the hard part of my research project is what do I do with all these numbers? And if you don't know, statistics is a field in math where you use certain techniques to prove or disprove things using statistics, using these math techniques. You can say that this factor made a difference or that the amount of flowers was greater in one year than the next, but you got to learn that statistics. Mm -hmm. Definitely do it in high school and for sure in college. You've got to be organized and you've got to know how to manage your time. That's true for high school. That's true for college. Okay. And then while you're in high school, focus on AP science and math courses. Definitely. Those are going to give you the background. You may not pass the test and that's okay. That's okay because you are better for taking that class. Just being in there, keeping up with the work, sitting for the exam that says something about you and you're going to be better prepared than someone who didn't do that. And so as you can see at the bottom, uh, this is my advice. Face your fear of the unknown. I can say this from personal experience. That was the biggest thing that held me back in my younger years was fear. Fear of not knowing how to do it. Fear of not knowing who to ask, you know? And as I got older, I was able to harness that fear into power, really, to be honest, power. You know what? I'm going to take that fear and I'm going to let it guide me. And, I'm, you know, I'm going to harness it. I'm going to take take control of it, you know? Don't let fear make your decisions for you, you know? And the thing that my husband has always told me, he's always been very supportive of, of my career advances, life begins right outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's easy to do what's comfortable. It's hard to do what you don't know, but that is what's going to open doors for you. Okay. So, let me just show my contact information. If you have any questions for me about the summer internship uh, internship pro, uh, program, you can email me there and I can share more info. Uh, and I will stop sharing right now and let, um, and let our moderator. We have some questions. Uh, Miss Alvarez's class is asking, if a student wants to be a veterinarian with wildlife, how can that help in the hospital setting? In a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's parallels because, you know, um, sometimes animals get the same diseases as, as people, mm -hmm. right? You and I can both get rabies, which is a viral disease. So obviously veterinary medicine is going to have some parallels. We oftentimes use similar medications, antibiotics for people, for animals. So, you know, I think there is some crossover there. And, and definitely if you wanna be a veterinarian, you get in on a study, you get in on that phage study, you know, because if those antibiotics are resistant in humans, they are in animals as well. So get in on phage re research in college uh, um, and, and put that on your resume. You know, and as you apply to veterinary school, there you go. Mm -hmm. I've done phage research. I know about antibiotic resistance, you know? So um, I, I think that would be a great, a great connection there. Yes. 
What would you say was the most difficult part about research? Uh, well, for me, like I say, the, the research was grueling itself. I was not in a nice air conditioned room. Mm -hmm. I was outside in the elements, in the heat, in the rain, in the cold, as I mentioned. Um, the plants I worked with are the, the monte, right? The plants in the monte, all of the plants with the thorns, because that those are drought adaptations, right? Right. To have those thorns, very, very small leaves. So I thought that was the hardest part, right? Coming back <laughs> scratched up and sunburned and dirty and sweaty. But then, like I said, I think I think the the data analysis was the harder. You know, <laughs> like I said, I thought, whoo. That was hard until I started looking <laughs> at the numbers and having to know what to do with them. But again, that very tough advisor that I had, had he, um, he was tough, but he was like a father to me. And this is a true story. He was very gruff. People were afraid to take his classes. Um, and I, I kind of, I think I became like a daughter to him because as soon as I finished my thesis defense, he said, you know what? I'd like to, I'd like to write two papers with you based on your research. And I'm going to give you top billing. I'm going to make you the primary author. So I'm actually a published author in two scientific journals, two scientific journals based on my thesis research. Mm -hmm. I, this is a funny story, but from the hospital after I had my son, I said, I need to call Dr. Judd. I need to tell him because remember mm -hmm. I had just finished my thesis defense the week before he and I began to exchange Christmas cards for the next, you know, 25 years. <laughs> so uh, relationships were built, but yeah, he helped me. Don't think I did it all on my own. It was tough, but he helped me. That's great. Uh, what do employers look for when someone decides to apply for a research position? Uh, I think here at the Research Institute, Somebody who has already done some research at the undergraduate level, I, I think that would be crucial. Um, at big universities like UT and A&M, for instance, it's going to be hard for an undergrad to actually be doing research, right? Usually the research positions are for the, the graduate students, the master's and PhD students. You, you just try to get your foot in there somewhere if you can. The beauty of UTRGV is that it's small enough where you can get that research experience, right? It's a small enough university, you know, find your favorite professor and ask, how can I get involved in research here? How, what, what do I need to do? Who do I need to talk to? This is what I like. Who, who can you direct me to? With the medical school here, I mean, it's an excellent opportunity. So definitely, that's what I would say reach out to somebody, get help as, as far as being qualified. Again, try to get that under your belt. Um, like I said, in high school, if you can take AP research and seminar, do that as well. I mean, that's part of your resume. Um, come, to our, come to our internship program in the summer. All of those things can give you that edge that other kids don't have. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's do you think students should concentrate in business as well to help adapt to the business of the hospital? Uh, I think it would be helpful, definitely. Um, through my teaching career, through being a baseball booster, vice president, secretary, treasurer, all of those things, I had some experience with business, with invoicing and quotes, uh, things like that. Uh, speaking to my husband every day about the business that he does. I had some background knowledge, um, but I think someone coming in, in fact, I can tell you, we, one of the researchers was asking about a quote. She said, I, she's one of the ones doing research, but she said, I don't understand. Uh, what's the difference between a quote and an invoice? And so we had to tell her, you know, because she's working with somebody doing research and, and they wanted a quote. Right. And she, she didn't know the difference. So definitely, I think taking some business classes would be important. You know, um, it can't hurt anybody, you know, to know about business, to know about accounting, things like that. You know, and, and, and in high school, you do have some classes like that that can really steer you. Just give you that background info that just gives you an edge. That's great. Uh, any students or teachers that have questions, go ahead and I've opened the chat, put them in the chat. Um, Come on, answer questions, ask questions. <laughs> you've, um, 
made a big change from teaching to working at the hospital. So Mm -hmm. now that you've been there a little while, what have you found has been the biggest change between the two positions? Hmm, what has been the biggest change? Um, Well, for me here in the Research Institute, it's a much smaller environment. You know, I was working at a big school with a lot of employees uh, and a lot of students attending the school. Um, This Research Institute, again, we're a little branch of DHR. Um, What I can tell you is I am so impressed by DHR, so well run. Um, so many procedures and policies in place, very, very professional. Um, so that's one of the biggest differences. I'm coming from a high school where it's a little bit more informal to a very formal workplace. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to dress appropriately. You need to behave appropriately. Um, and then again, like I say, just standard operating procedures for every single thing and just very well run. That's one of the biggest differences, I think, going from a more informal to a formal setting. What, um, what drew you to that? I know you retired from teaching, but you could have really done anything. What drew you to going to DHR and working in um, research and development? Um, I saw the job post and I thought, whoa, this is perfect. Looking at the job description, these are all things I can do and I have experience with. Plus the, plus the opportunity to work with people doing research, to work with the hospital, because remember my initial intent was healthcare, mm-hmm. but I was afraid. I was afraid, you know? So it, it kind of helped me get back to my roots. I wanted to be here. And, and to be honest, once I reached um, retirement eligibility, I was like, hmm, what can I do? Should I go to nursing school? You know, I mean, I've been thinking of these things. What can I do? And those thoughts were geared typically towards healthcare. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it's full circle. Yes, it is. It is amazing how um, you never know what will come up. And I I think that's an important thing for students to know. You never know what opportunity will come your way. And like you said, you can't be afraid to take a chance, uh, step outside your comfort zone and try something new. It I have always said that about because I left the classroom to do what I'm doing now. And I always uh, joked that I always had that teaching thing to fall back on if I, if I needed to. So I highly encourage students to take a chance on something. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, you learned something new. So Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think that's, yeah, definitely. And, and again, that's just one thing that I would convey to students, you know, even, even when they were on the fence about staying in AP bio, I don't know if I can do this. How will you mm-hmm. know if you don't try? How right. will you know? You know, let me grab your hand. Of course, that's, you know, right. metaphorically. Let me grab your hand and help you. Let uh-huh. me help you. You work with me and I'll help you get through the course, yeah. you know, and, 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 Again, all these things we're we're mentioning, some of you are on that track. Some of you are afraid to even take your first AP course. Try it, try it. What's the worst that can happen? You'll know that you're not ready just right now. Right. You you can try the next year. Mm -hmm. You know, there's baby steps and it is scary once you're stepping outside that comfort zone. It's very scary. I can't tell you as a presenter for College Board how many times (laughs) right before I started presenting, Okay, why did I sign up for this? I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Okay, I'm gonna go out there. I'm gonna be confident. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just reroute this this fear. Mm-hmm. So I, I hope you have more questions for me because as you can see, I love talking. <laughs> <laughs> I have to Anything. say it, it's it's a different having a teacher um, on the other side. It's. it's just makes things because that's my background. So that makes yeah. it a little bit easier. Yes. Come on, what kids. Is, what ask me some questions. Yeah. What advice do you have for uh, students who are interested in research and um, not just what they can do now, but what they can do once they finish uh, high school? Well, uh, again, 
and it may not even have to be medical research. You may be interested in other kinds of research, but when you get to your university, again, find that favorite professor. And I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this. One of the best things that uh, I think you can do is establish relationships with professors, you know? Uh, go visit during the office hours that, because it's different in college. You don't just show up, hey, I'm here. They have office hours. This is when you're allowed to see them. Some are very um, open and they'll say, email me anytime, but find that individual who seems receptive, go visit, say, you know, like, um, I, I noticed you did your PhD and whatever. That's really interesting. How did you do it? Just start talking to them, develop relationships. That's what opens doors, boys and girls. Two things I can tell you also, the world is a very small place, mm -hmm. very small. So as I told my offspring, my two kids, um, never burn bridges, you know, never burn bridges because you never really know who can give you a job opportunity or uh, a research opportunity, but get to know those professors network, you know, networking is also so valuable. You know, if you have, if you have a friend who's a physician, you know, a family friend, talk to that person. Hey, I'm really interested in what you do. Here's another thing. If you didn't know students, um, there are published articles out there. If you're interested in research, just look up. Look up whatever it is. If you're interested in phage research, and I'll get that link for you in just a bit, um, look it up. You know, look for papers, published papers, you know, scientific research. Start learning, uh, you know, beyond making those connections and trying to get research opportunities in college. Just, just becoming more educated is going to make you stand out in a crowd. You know, if you can talk to a professor, a physician that you're interviewing with about whatever it is that you've been learning about, again, that is going to make you stand out. I, one, I remember one particular student, he asked me to write a letter of recommendation for him. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Can you give me your resume? And what I found was that he had been doing Coursera courses on his own in business for years. Mm -hmm. He had so many courses that he was taking outside of high school online to increase his business knowledge. And I was so, I was so impressed by that. And that was one of the things I really um, stressed in the letter. This kid is going above and beyond. He's not just doing regular high school stuff. He's taking these online courses, you know, just to be more well-rounded, more educated. He's going to make it in the business world. He's passionate. So that would be something as well. If you don't know about it, Coursera, Course, Core A. Yeah, I hadn't yeah, heard of Coursera. that. I wondered if students had heard of that yet or not. Yeah, um, I'll put it in the chat. chat they have. We have another question. Sure. Will you be having high school volunteers for research and development at DHR, or due to COVID, will you uh, still be having the volunteer program? Okay, let me, that question sounds like something I need to check into. So will we be having high school volunteers? Yeah, they have a program called Volunteen. And the past few summers, of course, they haven't been able to have it due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure uh, Miss Alvarez is one of the teachers. Um, and she's asking the question, but I get asked this question, usually starting February or March, because that's uh -huh. when they used to take the application. Okay. Uh, I will ask. I have not heard anybody speak of that just yet. Perhaps because of our current dry, right. our current situation. You know, um, it's hard to plan. We were talking about it before we came on. It's hard to plan even a month ahead of time. I was asking something two or three days from now, and we really we <laughs> won't know until that day what we're able and not able to do. Yes, um, we've been trying to plan our February event, and uh, the problem is this that we just, we haven't known how many individuals we can invite, what's gonna yeah. be the seating arrangement. And, and it, it's just, it's made life really hard. And yeah, uh, Ms. Alvarez is saying all her kids are asking already if they're gonna have the volunteer program. I don't think, volunteer. I think two summers now they haven't been able to have it and, and it would be great if, if we could get back to that. Okay. But I know I definitely you could say yes now and by June, everything be totally different or say no now change. and by June. Okay, here is that link and maybe somebody else can 
open it and share it. Okay. But here's the, the link to the paper that was published on the bacterial phase research by Dr. Rao and Dr. Betancourt Garcia, who are the primary authors and who work here. You know, when I Thank send you. out the link for the recording of this, I'll make sure that I include that also. And then the teachers not only will have this recording to watch, but they can refer to that uh, journal article. Yeah, I, I cannot open that link myself without uh, leaving the meeting. Yeah. So here's another thing. I thought that the school computers were super locked down. <laughs> um, it's it's very, very regulated here. It's a age. whole other level at a hospital. <laughs> it is. It is. And and the reason, boys and girls, is that there's patient information. Yes. Right. We, we can't be using our computers for uh, inappropriate things, just like we can at the school. But um, I think there's such a volume of information. So everything is really, really restricted. Um, but anyway, I will ask about that program. Um, okay. Anything else? Yes. Ah, I know what can, I was going to say. Go ahead. Can you tell us about the future of research and development? What are some uh, new um, topics coming up that kids can think about um, that they'll do, let's say, 10 years from now? Well, um, I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I think COVID is going to be at the top of that list mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it just keeps mutating. Here's something really interesting. I was talking to Dr. Betancourt. See, this working here feeds my need for education. So I was talking to Dr. Betancourt about this, this new Omicron uh, strain. Mm -hmm. And I was asking, like, you know, is there any chance that people getting infected with this uh, will give them some sort of resistance to, you know, COVID in general. And she said, no, this Omicron had 106 different mutations. Wow. It's almost like a brand new COVID in that aspect. And, and the mutations, if you're an AP bio, the mutations are impacting um, the proteins on the outside of the virus there. So it, you know, if you've studied signal transduction receptors, and, and binding to, to uh, the receptor sites, um, it's, it's a whole new ball game. So I think definitely COVID is gonna be on that list. I think antibiotic resistance is gonna be on that list. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a serious, serious problem and we have got to come up with some sort of solution and maybe these phages are it, you know, because it, since bacteria reproduce every 20 minutes, you know, they make a lot of babies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very easy for them to mutate. They're very simple unicellular organisms. Um, so mutate rapidly and then pass that on to the next population of bacteria. So this resistance thing is a real problem. They have the ability to, to conjugate with each other. That is shared genes. Hi, I'm antibiotic resistant. I'm not, let me help you out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think these are going to be some of the, the major things that, that are still an issue now coming up in the next decade for sure. And we'll uh, what I was going to say about Coursera, let me throw this out, is okay. my daughter wants to go to dental school and she wants to be an orthodontist and um, it's pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, she's working really hard in college, but I said, you, you got to do other stuff. So for her, I'm like, okay, I know all these dentist guys. Okay. Let me hook you up. And so she's gone in and she's done some observations, but you know what else I said, you need to start taking Coursera courses. Yes. You need to start taking dentistry classes just to just to be able to talk about it. Should mm -hmm. you get a dental school interview? So whatever, whatever your field, check out Coursera. OK, the classes are free for the most part. OK, I'm going to add that to the what I send out to the teachers so they can talk about that with their um, students also. Oh, yeah. There's business classes in there. I think coding. I was also the girls who code sponsored. Do I know how to code? No. <laughs> but you have um, to learn to code. <laughs> how was that? You have to learn to code. <laughs> well, that's why I had the club, right? Um, yeah. And so we began learning some of the coding languages in the club. And, and they even have some, some free courses on that stuff, too, if you're interested in that. I mean, check it out. That's great. So as we wrap up um, this session today, 
the last thing I always like to ask is, what do you love about what you do? I, you know what? I, I love biology. I just do. You know, I love studying it. I loved teaching it. And now I'm here just in a biological environment every day. You know, I'm talking about the research. Dr. Rao, who is our CEO, we have a little, a little group chat. And every day he's sending the most recent literature, the most recent published articles on all kinds of topics. And so again, it just feeds my need to learn every day. And so, you know, it's just perfect for me. I can keep learning. Uh, I can make a difference through the research, contribute to the community and, and still get to work with students in our student okay. programs. That's so. great. Ms. Eddie, thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate your, your information and your feedback and giving us a view of uh, research and development and DHR and what they do for the community. Students, thank you, so thank you for joining us. Teachers also, uh, I will be posting the link by the end of the day and have a good day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.